pretty quickly this morning because I realized we had this going on. So I'm sure I left a lot of important things out. So just to ask questions as we go along. Um, what I wanted to talk about is, um, you know, just the, the data layout of our tables. Um, you know, just so you understand that because it has implications for performance and how much memory it's used and, you know, data compression and, and all sorts of things. So whenever a user pulls up a table, they just see something like this, rows and columns. Um, but this is basically just a logical view. Um, under the covers, you know, this has to be represented in a way that can be stored. And so the traditional way of doing this is a row oriented storage. And so with this, you store all of the data for a row next to each other. So, you know, here you would have one large file where, you know, this row is there and then next is this row and the next is this row and then next is this row. Um, so, you know, if you look at a case with this where you just want to look at a single column, um, you have a few problems. First of all, uh, you read way too much data. So to get the data for column one, you also have to read the data for columns two and three because it's next to it in the file, um, which kind of sucks. Um, also, uh, you have fragmented memory access. So if you want to go, if you want to go sequentially through the values of column one, you're taking large jumps um, through your memory to get to those values. And so you're, you end up uh, paging in and paging out a lot of data uh, just to get the values. Again, uh, performance kind of sucks when you do that. Um, so if you look at uh, column-oriented storage, uh, you basically, instead of looking at rows of data, you look at columns of data. So for example, here, all of column one's data could be stored in a single file, and that whole file would be integers. Uh, that way, uh, you know, you know how big the data is. And so if you want to go to the 43rd element, you just scoot down 43 times the number of bytes for the data type, and then you're right there. Um, you know, column two is doubles. You could do the same, th same thing. Column three is strings, and we'll get to that in just a second. So, you know, here, if we look at the same case where we're just looking at column one, uh, you know, we're loading minimum data. All you have to do is load the data for column one. You know, columns two and three, uh, you never access, so there's no need to load that. Um, also, when you're looking at the values of column one, they are sequential in memory and dense, so you're not having to page in and out a lot of data. All you have to do is look at that specific set of data. Um, a third advantage you get here is compression. So for example, if all of column one is a single value, you can compress that you know, down to the value plus the number of entries. Um, so uh, anyway, that, that ends up being a big benefit as well. Um, so if we go and look at the string columns, um, in the string columns, we're using what's called a dictionary encoding. Uh, so, for example, if you have this column with these very long strings in it, you can represent that as a column of integers plus a uh, table lookup where you just have a key value lookup where you say zero is this very long string and one is this even longer string. And, you know, as long as you have repeated values, this works pretty well. If every entry ends up uh, being different, well, this might not be quite as good. Um, so anyway, uh, dictionary encoding is the most common way to store the, uh, the string, string column values. Um, okay, so any, any questions on anything up to this point? So if you compress, if you do col columnar compression, then you sort of lose the notion that you can randomly index a row by the offset, right? Because then it's irregular because you've compressed it. Or are you doing some kind of run length compression or what, what happens? Uh, you know, so what we've, what we've traditionally done is just use file system compression. Okay. Um, and that, that is actually, <laughs> at least if we look at the, the initial versions of this, nothing that we've looked at later, but um, in those initial versions, we found that file system compression worked better than us trying to do something fancy. 
um, and was far less error prone. Um, so, you know, and, and with the file system compression, you know, it is, you know, making the values so you can index them sequentially. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if we use this dictionary encoding to encode strings and columns, does that mean that if I want uh, to write a function that's going to like encode a categorical column as integers, instead of writing a function to, to do that as a user, I can like just uncover something because it's already there? I don't know. You'd have to ask Ryan. I, I don't know that we expose this, hmm. but sure. Maybe we could. I mean, could so like theory, in theory, you could write maybe like a lower level function, like a Java function or something, to do that, where you don't potentially. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that, that's a question for how how exactly we implemented it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, that could be really useful because all the deep learning libraries that I've been working with require numerical data sure. in all the columns. So. Yeah. The the, the uh, what we'll get to next is combining multiple subtables, and it may the values are likely to be inconsistent between the subtables, so that could cause a problem. Okay, sure. Uh, my only question is, are the keys in the dictionary encoding automatically uh, longs, or are they? is there any smart casting to be done for like smaller static tables? Or? Um, I think we use integers, not longs. Okay. Um, and I doubt we're doing anything super smart. Um, you know, if, even if you look at something like a, a, a parquet file, they have dictionary encoding as well, and I assume they do it the same way, but I'm not certain. What does that mean for like really huge tables with tons of different strings, you might just run out of bounds of an integer? And... It's possible, yeah. Okay. That, that would be a real lot of strings though, right? It would be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially with like date time columns, we treat them as date times, not strings. So that's the only yeah. place that I could think of where you would run into something like that. Yeah. But two two billion strings. I mean, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to work with. No one wants to do yeah. the two. Okay, so, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so so the, the the daytime column is a is an interesting case uh, which I, I didn't cover, and so you know, the so the daytime when it is stored, it is stored as a column of longs, okay, and then those get reinterpreted as daytimes. Okay. And so, sense. you know, you could add, you know, if you have some something you want to serialize, you can encode it and then decode it. All right. Anything else up to this point? No. Okay. Um, all right. So, our our large tables um, you can think of as being like trees. Um, and so we have a. They have a few different levels. So the the uh, you know, the the deepest part of the tree here, uh, you you have partitions where we map some value to a column name, and so we're not using this much in uh, the the community version yet, but in the enterprise, it's a it's a, definitely a thing. So, for example, say say you have a a large table, um, uh, you may have it partitioned by date. And so the date would be a directory name on the file system. And so we map that name on the file system to a column in the table, right? And so if you're doing a query and you do it first on, on date to pick a subset of dates, then that means you have to read far less of the tree to get the data you're looking at. And so you, know, you get efficiency by doing that first. Um, so beyond those, uh, and uh, I, I guess one other detail here is for the partitioning columns, not all of them need to be actual columns. Some of them can be invisible to the user. So for example, if you want to write parts of a table to different, uh, storage systems so that you get uh, parallelization in that dimension. You can write them each to a different directory, but those directories don't show up as columns. Um, okay, so then the the next level in the tree is the, uh, the grouping columns. And so when you have a table, 
you can order the table so that uh, similar values are together. Um, so for example, you have a table of, let's just say, stock data. You could order that table so that all of the Apple data is together and all of the Google data is together. And those groups are called grouping. <laughs> and so you can have multiple groupings, but they need to um, respect the tree. So for example, if you grouped on column one, but column two, you, know, you have values that, are, that appear in multiple groups, then that's gonna fail because it, it breaks the tree assumption. Okay, and then beyond that is just the, the data that is for a given group. So if we go to grouping, I just created an example here where we have column one and column two. Column one has two values, one and two. Column two has three values, one, two, and three. So if we group on column one and column two, we end up with three groups. You have this first group that has one, one as being the values that it's grouped on. And then you have a second group that has one, two, which is the values that it's grouped on. And then the third one, you have the value two and three, which is what's grouped on. Um, so the, anyway, the, the red boxes show this. Um, and then uh, we have an index that indicates where a group begins and where it ends. And so you know, that makes you know, grabbing uh, a section of the data fast. So for example, in the, in the stock case, if you want to grab the Apple data, if the data is grouped on the symbol, all of that data is next to each other and you can you know, very quickly find it and load it. Um, so, um, the data we have coming in is typically not in a, um, in an order that's appropriate for grouping. So for example, if you have stock quotes coming in, we're normally getting those quotes in the order that they come in and that order does not have all of Apple together and all of Google together. So, um, <clears throat> overnight. Um, when that data is moved from the real time to the historical storage, we do a process which is called merge. And during that process, the table, the real time table is loaded. It's then sorted into a grouping appropriate format and then written out. That way, when you do the, whenever you access the historical data, you get all of the speed and indexing improvements from having the grouping. Um, I didn't include it in the slides, but if you want to see what the types of a column are on a table, just do a dot get meta, and then there that will tell you, you know, about the column names, the column types. It'll also give you information about whether, you know, it's a normal column or a partitioning column or a grouping column, um, and that can be useful um, for debugging of various sorts. So. For example, if you have a query that's running unusually slowly and you think it should be fast, you can uh, call it get meta to see how the data is laid out for that table and see if, uh, you know, if your performance improvement is behaving the way you think. So for example, if you're doing a, a filter on uh, underlying symbol for stock, um, you know, but your column happens to not be grouped or partitioned, then that's gonna be slow when you expect it to be fast. So anyway, that, that's just a debugging resource. Um, and that's what I've got. Any, any questions? Do we have any examples? Is there any way, like, how does, maybe in the enterprise version, how does a user determine, like set or can a user set which column they want to be partitioning versus grouping versus normal? Right now, no. So the, the way the way it works in enterprise is um, there there are config files, and in those config files, they list what the columns are and what the types are, and whether they're partitioned or grouping or whatever. And so <laughs> when when the data is stored then it uses that config file to say, okay, well, I need to sort it this way or that way before writing it out. On the 
community saw it. And, and then you know, it would make sense to have something to say, I have this table, make it into a group table or something. We don't have that. Yeah. Um, but it is a feature that would make sense. Um, on the community side right now, um, I th think the only data source that supports any of these more advanced features is the new uh, uh, Parquet source. And so, you know, Ryan was is putting a thing in to do the partitioning where you can say, get all of these Parquet files and make them visible as a table. And then um, I think he is also implementing a feature in there to do uh, to deal with um, but I'm not as certain on that. <clears throat> yeah, as I understand it, the I mean, Chip's right that on the enterprise side, the groups and partitions really are are they're a result of the merge process. Like when you lay down the data, you create an instruction set about how to do that. <clears throat> there, that's just not something that we care about on the community side. We're not telling people what to, how to store their data or what to do with their data. But in regards to Parquet. There are some of these features naturally built into the protocol um, so that there is grouping um, and there is something that he, he called predicate pushdown, which I'm interpreting from Ryan's words as, yeah, I want to grab a small amount of the data from a larger parquet file. You know, parquet, parquet files are really sort of have this directory structure as well. And if you only want to grab a small set, it sounds like that's already supported. So we're more or less taking our concept of pulling a group from a deep haven format and marrying it to doing the same thing on the community side in a parquet. Yeah, so the, 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 the whole predicate thing, I think is equivalent to the, uh, the, the, uh, the partitions we have. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I expect some of these concepts to come into um, Kafka as well, because Kafka has a whole idea of how they're partitioning data and, and such. So anyway, I'm not sure how it's going to work. Um, I guess one other thing on the uh, enterprise side that I didn't cover because I don't know a lot about it is I think Andy has been working on a uh, another on an index that is not just grouping. Um, where, uh, you know, you could just index a column. Um, Pete, do you know any more about that? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, SQL obviously allows for user-designed indexes on whatever, you know, based on whatever key, and they can be orthogonal to one another. And that's something, oh, I want to take my data that's partitioned by date and grouped by underlying symbol. I want to then create an index based on 15 minute time buckets or something like that. So I can just grab the stuff from 10 to 10, 15 every day of the past year for the symbol Google. That's a totally reasonable uh, use case that we want to support. Andy has put some infrastructure into the enterprise side to support that. But one, it's not really flexible programmatically. It's really an extension of this merge process and the configuration that Chip described before. So it's really like phase one of this one. And then two, he's only implemented it for data that is laid out in the Deep Haven format because there's this tension between Parquet on enterprise and Parquet in community that we want to settle out, settle down. <clears throat> and likely it will be oh, we're going to port a lot of Parquet capabilities from community back to enterprise and then implement the indexes uh, related, you know, implement the intersection of indexes, deep haven indexes and Parquet tables on enterprise on top of that. So, <clears throat> so indexes are, are a thing conceptually, but I don't think they'll hit community for three months at the earliest. Six months. So, Mike, you go ahead. Once data is in the the table, is it possible to to dereference it and pull data out of the table, like the get meta, like get column three, row five, or something? Uh, yeah. So it's possible, but uh, you, you you want to be very careful about when you do that. Um, so the 
So in general, we want users to be using the query operations because you know those are designed to do locking and things properly. They're also designed to um, you know automatically update when data changes. Um, but if you are a developer stud and can handle the locking in cases, there are. Uh, you could do on a table, you can get a column source, which would have the values for the column. And then you can use the, uh, the K values to retrieve uh, values there. Um, so it is absolutely possible, but it's a feature where we don't want most people doing it. So and Alex is using that for his stuff right now to uh, fill in the, uh, uh, the tensors that are getting created. So Mike, you've lived in the DB world for a long time. Any any questions? Uh, or, no, I think or I'm good. Comments on things I missed? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Uh, I uh, it um, I guess I just wonder about customers. Like, if they can't pick their partitioning, do we? Like, you always have this problem of computers try to do magical things because they think they're smarter than you. And if you're picking a partition for the customer, then that maybe it doesn't work right sometimes, or data changes and the weight of certain partitions changes and something gets hot and you didn't want that. But then you also like the other end of the spectrum is like, well, you trust users to pick partitions and choosing partitioning keys is pretty hard because you usually pick the wrong one and something gets hot later on and you didn't think of it. So I just wonder how that has been working out for, for, for this product. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we, when we, when well, this was initially created, um, you know, it, uh, you know, the the partitions were very rigid and how it was getting spit out. And as you would expect, some stock traded a billion times more than some other stock. And so we'd start filling up a partition uh, way more if we equally distributed the, the symbols over them. And so then uh, that led to the ability to create formulas to do the, 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 uh, the partitioning over storage. And that ended up working out fine. Um, I don't know if we've had to do anything more complex than that. Um, you know, I, I think the, you know, in, in, in laying data out this way, you know, there's, there's kind of an implicit assumption that the user understands how they're going to be querying the data. Um, and We've generally found that to be true. Uh, Pete can speak if there, if we have many cases where where that's a problem. But you know, a lot of times, uh, it seems like when somebody starts using this, they're more confused about it than after they've used it for a while. I tuned out. Sorry, so I don't have too much to add. Um, <laughs> people, I mean, yeah, we. I think how to. How to set up merge jobs, i.e. how to store historical data, is something we spend a good number of hours with people uh, or with customers about in the first week or two of their onboarding process. And it's sort of case by case, table by table. Is that a, the right answer, Mike? Is that a... I don't think we do too much magic for them. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's you know, so so I'm, I'm I mean, I guess I'm glad you're saying like there's no there's not too much magic because magic always breaks and then no one understands it and then it's magic and then people blame the system because it's not magical enough or it's magical in the wrong way or whatever, mm -hmm. right? You know, it, like computer science is just the study of things that are surprisingly complicated, right? Like, what, <laughs> why, where did all this come from and why are we here? Like, uh, that, that's that's what it's a study of. So 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 like you know if you know so in in the in the in the, in the storage schema makes sense to me. I mean, like you're on these things and then you put a tree under it and then that seems great or you know you, you have a tree and then you put a column store under it I think, I think it's a really good compromise like and i'm just wondering how it works out right that, that's all that's you know that's my that's my that's my main comment yep once they i mean once they understand those concepts then they talk to us about their data and we talk to them about how it's going to get queried and then <clears throat> for capital markets it's pretty easy because most people are like yeah partitioning on date sounds right <laughs> like that's that's you know and then you've knocked out one really really good thing what you do from there you know is sort of case by case we've kind of already figured out the 
the the first principle i would say yeah yeah but you, you know you, you can imagine a case like uh you know credit card transactions or something like that where you may want to partition on user and in that case um you know i, I think that's a case that uh you know we probably need to think more about because you know you would create a partition per user but then you would need to be updating the, the data in those partitions and that's not a use case we've really you know explored so all right well it's, it's certainly it's certainly situational right like like look I, and it's going to depend upon the it's going to it's so it's so dependent upon the actual case right like mike sounds like a great way to, to, you know, I mean, that's not a lot of credit card transactions, right? But if it turns out a user is Microsoft corporate Amex master account, then, well, shit, man, that's a lot of transactions, right? You know, and, and so, you know, it's, it's so situational. It depends on the user, it depends on their data definition, it depends on their way, you know, everything, right? And it's just, it's very, it's, it, some users are accustomed to it and some users seem like they really struggle with it. And, and then right. if, if the, you know, I guess the, I guess the worst scenario is like the users are struggling with it and it's also based on some magic-y kind of tricky little thing that the system is trying to decide for you, then, then, then things end up, that's when things end up getting particularly shitty because then, then it really is magic because no one understands it, right? That, that's really what magic is. Like there's a reason for it, but you just didn't understand the reason for it. Like th this isn't magic. I, you didn't have a quarter in your ear. Like I, I managed to stick the quarter underneath my thumb knuckle and you didn't see it right and that's that's what magic is right until people understand the trick and then now they understand the trick then they then they abuse it right and then you have a problem right yeah all right sounds alex do like you have any questions i don't no no it sounds like mike's not very fond of magic <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, it, it stinks right like the, like most of the time i'm frustrated with computers is when they're trying to out guess me about what i want right are, are you trying to write a letter? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not right now. Oh, Mike. So, so, so Mike, can we? Can you bring some of this anger to a white paper about SQL? That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I probably could. Right. I, you know, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. A after that, you can take on Clippy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cl Clippy. It was so well intended. Just like Comic Sans, right? I mean, just. <laughs> It's going to have a personal blog, a blog soon with a blog post titled The, the Ducking Problem with Autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's perfect, right? It's absolutely perfect, right? It's, I went to this big data, I went to the big data show, the big, you know, the, 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 the New York City one, right? So I can't remember the actual name of it, but like this guy was there, this presenter was there, he's ripping on Microsoft, right? Like, oh, Microsoft, yeah, look, you know, Clippy's going to pop up and say, hey, do you want to write a letter, right? And and use that to rip on Microsoft. But look at look at every other company doing every other thing with any other autocomplete correct grammar 